In the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a little journey presenting the voices and images of a cross-section of refugee women who participated in a project with us a few years ago. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Vajuk Nungar people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we present and would like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. Our commitment to work with all Australians and people from across the world, including our First Nations people, are at the core of the work that we do, especially the work that I do in my research with women and it's reflective of Curtin's values. Today, I'm really thankful for you to spend this time and listen to what um, I'm going to reflect on. But I'd like to acknowledge also the Indian Council General, Charandasi Dantu, who has spent time from a busy schedule to be here, Professor Seth Kun, the DVC International, who's here, Mrs. Yaso Punatarai, the Councillor from the City of Canning, Rehab Ahmed, the program manager from Ishar Multicultural Services, Health Services, who's our community partner, and Professor Rosa Alati, my head of school from the Skirton School of Population Health, and all of you guests who are here, and colleagues and friends. Now, I would like to begin by just giving you a little perspective about refugee women in Australia. Australia has a highly controlled refugee and humanitarian program. We bring in about 13,000 people every year, and that has been stalled since COVID-19. There's a punitive approach, as we know, to asylum seekers or boat arrivals, and there's the offshore pathway. The offshore pathway contains a category, and that category is women at risk visa. The settlement experiences of many of these women are shaped by intersecting factors but there's very limited research from a gendered perspective. What happens to women who come at this women at risk visa or who have come afterwards on family resettlement? And we call for a strength-based approach and focus on resilience. Often, refugee women are highlighted as weak. They are visibly different here if they come from Africa, if they are from the Middle East, if they wear a hijab or a head covering, you know? but yet, they display unique resilience, and that will be shown in my presentation. The Photo Voice Project. Through this project, we wanted to explore refugee women's experiences of settlement in Western Australia. We wanted to recommend actions to support the successful settlement of women. And we wanted to inform the community about the women's lives through a traveling exhibition. So there is a traveling exhibition and it's in the access gallery. There are nine banners there. You know? They have actually traveled with me across community libraries in Perth, nationally and international, internationally too. You know? What is Photo Voice? You know, in Photo Voice, we give people cameras. So they all got a camera, the women got a camera each. They record community strengths, issues that face their lives and concerns through their photographs. They promote critical dialogue because after they have the photographs, they talk about and share about the photographs. And then we try to share these findings to policymakers. It's participatory because it seeks to present, represent the voice of those who are often ignored and marginalized. And it empowers through critical re reflection where we hope for social change. Yeah? Photo voice has been used in migration and health research. It, it was used from 1997, firstly in China, to look at what the one child policy did on women's lives. You know, when the government implemented the one child policy, what happened to women? Because suddenly their reproductive health and their reproductive rights were controlled by the government. We had other research that looked at language and literacy level in Uganda, an IDP camp, which is the internally displaced Clare camp, explored people's community issues and advocated for school renovations. In the United States, it explored barriers and resources to engaging in physical activity among so Somali women in San Diego. In Canada, it looked at the resilience of South Sudanese women and recommended an enhanced resilience model 
for services engaging with refugees. And in South Korea, it looked at the social exclusion of young North Korean refugees. In recent times, it has looked at homelessness among women in Toronto in Canada. It has also looked, one of the most famous ones is children of brothels in Calcutta, India, where, where the children were given, or children of sex workers were given cameras to actually capture images of their complex lives. You know? We worked in a participatory way with the community partner, and I'm really glad, Rehab, you're here you know, with Ishar Multicultural Women's Health Center. Two project officers were invited participants and coordinated the interpreters. We also provided crash facilities for participants with young children. We had a cultural reference group and ethics approval was obtained from Curtin University. But none of this is possible if we don't have a funding partner. And our funding partner was Healthway, the Health Promotion Foundation of Western Australia that has funded me for my participatory and community pro projects. The aim is empowerment and resilience and looking at health and well-being of populations. The project team was myself, a PhD student, Anita Lumbus. Shelley Gower was the research officer. We had Rehab and Sally from Ishar Project staff. We had a photographer. So in my projects, I worked with a community photographer who helps the women document or teaches them about social photography. And if any of you want more information later, there's a little handout with my email and you can email me. You know? So what were the steps that we used? We discussed the project. We talked about the ethics of taking photographs. We wanted to tell the women that, see, we are going to share the photographs. So it was important for you to tell your participants that these photographs will be displayed. And the women all said, yes, we are happy for our children's photographs to be displayed, for our family photographs to be displayed, or pictures of the environment. With, with Nat Brunov, the, the photographer, we talked about camera practice, the ground rules, the topics, and they selected what they were actually going to take the images of. They were going to take images of family. They were going to take images of food, of the environment, of their lives in Western Australia. And then there was photo sharing and group discussion. And sometimes that was really powerful because sometimes it opened up previous trauma. And, and then there was a commentary among the women, you know, when they talked about coming from a country of war to Western Australia and then living in safety and peace, when they talked about having no education in Southern Sudan and here being able to go to their ch children's school and participate in the school was a big thing for one mother here. You know? And then out of the women who were there, they, they themselves gave the quotes. So the quotes that are present in the photographs have been shared by the women themselves. You know? Then from the women, there were 11 women whom we actually interviewed one-on-one -on -one to have a more in-depth reflection on their lives in Western Australia. So we had 44 participants. As you can see, 12 countries as diverse as El Salvador, to Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Myanmar, Vietnam, Lebanon. So there was a whole host of countries from different parts of the world. The length of time, this was interesting for us because some of them were there between one and three years, but some of them were there more than 10 years. And even then they wanted to participate in the project. They wanted to share their thoughts about Western Australia. Yeah? And we used the short technique for critical dialogue so what do you see in the photograph? What is really happening in the photograph and how does it relate to your life? What does this situation say? What are the strengths or the concerns? And how can we be empowered by this new understanding, especially for policy change? So although it was qualitative, although it was participatory, we wanted to be able to impact policy at the government level in whatever way we could using the women's images and voices. So now I'm going to share the photographs. One of the themes were pre-arrival experiences. And one of the women wanted to share the lamp. She says, light now makes me feel safe. 
war took all the light from our lives here. You know? So in the camps, they had this Petromax lamp. They didn't have electricity here. You know? And we used this light to hold and uh, survive. And she wanted this photograph to be displayed in, in um, her images that she shared. The safety and opportunity, my son going to the library. It is important to me because in my country, it was not possible for children to go safely to school or to a library. Yeah. And I think this is a poignant reminder for all of us is that how fortunate we are in this country where we have free education right until age 17 for children. Yeah. And she says, they can now, my children can have the opportunity that I didn't have, and that is to be educated. In Australia, parents can be involved with their children's school, unlike in Sudan. I enjoy being part of my son's school. The importance of family, and this came out, the uncontested importance of family in the lives of these women, you know. She said, this is the first photo she took off from the camera that was given to her. They were given little Sony cameras to keep. So you know, the project allowed me to get the cameras and to keep the cameras. And she says, I used to feel lonely as I didn't have anyone in Australia, except my family and my children. Now that I feel, have my children, I no longer feel lonely. And when I look at him with the picture that I see, it's like she's jumping and I think of birds flying, she says. You know? the importance of family. Family is important. And here was a Middle Eastern woman saying, we love to be together. But unfortunately, my mom is not here because it is so hard to get a visa for her. And our interviews highlighted that, that it was just virtually impossible for women who had come or for people who have come on a humanitarian background to bring their family here. So the government doesn't give them visas. It actually makes it really difficult, even though they can pay for the visa, they can pay for the ticket to come. And even if it's for a visit, it's very difficult for them to bring their family here. Then support and community. So they said that making and cooking food and inviting friends was important to them here. And even though they don't have their family, support from the community was important. And ro role of a women's support service. And that is where Ishar comes in. Now, Ishar has been a multicultural women's health service for nearly 30 years. And to them, it was like their second home. You know? the, their family situation means they don't have many opportunities. And Ishar gives them this chance. It helps them make new friends, get some financial advice and help, and get counseling. And one of the main things is there are women GPs, there are women midwives, and there are women counselors who can talk in a language other than English with these women. And I think that's really vital and important. And it gives me a, a better life. Maintaining their culture and being in Australia was important. So here was the Vietnamese um, participant who said, keep keeping up with my traditional Vietnamese values. I'm proud to be Vietnamese and proud of my Australian citizenship. So they have this dual identity that they are really proud of. And here was this Iraqi woman. She was an older woman, but she wanted to participate in the project. She was one of the lucky few who came with the family and was able to be here. And she said, I enjoy baking and cooking traditional food for my family because my family liked the food I cook and it reminds them about the country. So she had this little oven in the patio and she wanted to share that, that she uses this often and shares it. What were the women's settlement experiences in Western Australia? Their main thing was language, barriers to learning English. So one of the things that the government does is it allocates 510 hours, but those 510 hours is just enough for them to get basic colloquial or conversational English, how to go to the market, how to travel by bus, but it actually doesn't give them the skills required to be employed profitably. And this is something that we have argued for with ministers with extending the English language um, classes that that these women have. Significance of social support. They need social support. They have family issues, they have children, and then the cultural adjustment. 
and feeling welcomed. Now, issues of racism, and this has been highlighted in recent times, you know, with, with where women have been marching for justice and equality. And this is something that the women felt when they were visibly different, the ra racism that they, that they encountered. Issues with the Australian system. I mean, we know how difficult it is to navigate our systems, but when they have to do that with housing, employment, education, transport, they find it very challenging. You know? And they draw on peer support, on cultural and personal resources. Some of the re recommendations that they have are English programs based on women's need, support to enter employment, accessible family reunion, the role of effective settlement and mainstream services, and a whole of a community approach to inclusion and welcoming people beginning a new life. So they all said, we would love you to come. We would like your team to come to our home. We'd like to cook you a meal and share with you. So that was important for them to have this approach to inclusion and welcoming people. You know? So when refugees are connected to support services, life becomes colorful, she said. Spring and autumn, and she had this photograph that she shared, um, shared in, the project, in the project. What were the reflections on the photo voice methodology? It was strength-based. It was focused on participant empowerment, community partnership. So Isha was as the community partner and a core researcher. So I've had this wonderful relationship with Isha that continues here. And basically, there were group sizes with multiple languages and ensuring support for participants. And the social change, role of university researchers, and this is consumer-driven research, so that there's an impact on the community. You know? And what were the benefits? The women felt that there was personal development. They each got a, ca a camera. Now it was easy, they have a phone, but this was a camera for them to keep. You know? They learned about how to take photographs, how to look at imaging, how to download those photographs and all of that. You know? Health and well-being, sharing their stories was a form of healing for them that they could relate with the other women. There was knowledge and learning and they developed social connections and relationships through the project. What were the benefits? So it engaged community women who were able to learn new skills and build their confidence. Partnering with Curtin has helped the community organization Ishar to offer its clients more services grounded in the research. And I hope that Ishar uses the results and the, the grants for further programs for, the, for themselves. You know? Our research in July 2018 was quoted in the Labour Party's dissenting report to federal government's proposed changes to citizenship legislation and English language following an advocacy letter. So Anita and myself wrote an advocacy letter. We sent it to 34 ministers, federal, federal um, ministers, and we got a reply back from 18 and then Labour used it in its report. This was especially on citizenship legislation and, the, and English language. You know? I assisted in the submission by the Public Health Association of Australia to a consultation on the National Women's Health Strategy 2020-2030. And at Curtin, we observed a National Day of Action in October 2018 to end offshore detention. And Shelley, who was one of the research officers of the project, myself and Dr. Elizabeth Newham, hosted a seminar. So one of our participants in the youth um, photo voice project was Naseem Yazdani. She was a refugee young woman from Iran and belonging to the Baha'i community. And she shared her journey from Iran, where she couldn't go for higher education, to Australia and then to an architecture student at Curtin. You know? So that was the uncontested importance of education for these women. You know? And underpinning our research is a commitment to achieve gender equity, participatory principle, and a strong focus on the social determinants of health. The Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations is an international conference that brings together women. In 2019, I showcased this project on how social protection system, along with access to public services in education, health and community outreach, empower women and provide them with a sense of safety and result in gender equality. 
Now the photo voice exhibition has been displayed in libraries across Perth, international conferences in Greece, USA, Canada, nationally in Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Newcastle University. And the exhibition highlights the resilience of women and calls for strengths-based approaches to be implemented in refugee health. So, I'll stop here and throw it open to the audience for any questions. Thank you very much. So Jay, when you hear the question, could you repeat the question into the mic so that we can get out of the recording? Okay, no problem. Yeah, if you could speak, project your voices. Yes. Hi, my name is Dr. Christine Spogan, and uh, my conducted some research using digital storytelling, in which I've also claimed as an empowering methodology. So I, I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about the metrics or methods you use to determine the empowerment aspects of the methodology. In, in order to understand the empowerment aspects, one of it was actual critical dialogue with the women and sharing their images and stories through that. You know? the, uh, so one of the things that we did was out of the 44 women who participated, 22 agreed for their photographs to be displayed and in the traveling exhibition. So it was quite empowering for them to be able to do that. The other, so the empowerment aspect that, that we had was one, the, the ability to learn a new skill of photography with a, photo, with a professional photographer. The second part was the ability to choose the photographs that they wanted shared. So those women who didn't want to participate in the touring exam, uh, exhibition then were able to have a scrapbook of photographs that was theirs to keep. The third one was the actual quotes that they shared from the photographs. You know? The fourth one was the interviews that we had with a smaller cross-section of women, where, where all of, they shared some of the recommendations. You know? So all of this was quite empowering for the, the women. You know? Wondering, are you going to revisit and go back to all those women and maybe repeat the Photo um, Voice project, but you know, with them several years on to see how they've gone and what's changed in their lives? Yes. Uh, I would like to. I have actually applied for some funding and I'll know the results in a few weeks. You know, but what I would like to see is the impact of COVID on their lives. You see, COVID on their lives as, you know, being in lockdown. They, they were already isolated and being in life, lockdown, and that has challenged them in different ways, you know. So it's something that we would always like to go back. But one thing I would like to say is that one of the recommendations was that they would like to be further empowered to, to be able to get, get jobs, you know. And oh, we applied for funding. So this project ended in 2017 and 2018 I applied for funding for the Empower project and we received funding. So women from refugee and migrants program uh, backgrounds are participating in the Empower project as a form of peer mentoring so that they can actually be employed. And some of the participants from the Photo Voice project took part in that and some of them actually have been able to gain employment here. So that has happened. And I think it's a good idea, and maybe I'll talk to Ishar to see if we can actually talk to a few women, you know, about changes or the things that have happened. I mean, COVID-19 has impacted everyone, but it would be interesting to see how it might have specifically impacted their lives and their journeys, you know. Yes. Yes. Hi, my question is, um, if you can go back to them and yes. see where they're traveling and how this has impacted positively. So that can become a success story yes. to other women okay. in similar areas. You know, we all deal with the women from migrants, refugees. So if you can make any of this out of the four people, yes. yeah, I guess we can have 10 success stories and we can share the success stories across in the local councils or anywhere. Uh, we will be choosing to those. 
but I want to know whether we can share that such a story and will that boost other people's self-esteem and effort? Okay. So Yas Yaso had um, a suggestion more, you know, that if we can actually share the stories of some of the women and see not only the project, but any subsequent pro project has had any impacts on their lives and showcase this with the councils, the local councils. I think that's really important because the local libraries and the local councils are something that they interact with, they do that, you know. Yes, is it? Um, I think it's it's a challenge to engage men in the dialogue or in the stories. You know, often the when I deal with women and youth in all my projects, there's a lot of women and youth who will participate, but a smaller number of men, you know, who will participate. And I think that challenge is across the board. So it's not only for these communities, but it's across the board. And it would be interesting to actually see how we can engage more men because we have to work with everyone in the community, both men and women, so that there's this concerted change that we would like. And especially with refugee and migrant women, it's really, really hard. Like we had a recognition for Australian of the Year, the, the community um, woman who won the award, she was a Kenyan woman, she came as a refugee woman to Sydney on a women at risk category here. Yeah? So she has achieved a lot. And there's this young lawyer who I was, I was actually looking at her story last night because I just wanted to see exactly what you were saying. Now she's from South Sudan. She had interrupted education. She came at 18 years to Victoria, again with a family migration category and a refugee category. So Nidal Nuon, you know, so she's a lawyer working in commercial litigation, done extremely well. So went to Victoria University and she got a, a scholarship to do her JD at Melbourne University. And Q&A asked her to come on a Q &A, ABC Q&A event. You know. After that event, she got trolled. You know, she got trolled, she had to stop her Facebook and Twitter account. And it actually made her rethink on how she could actually continue her advocacy. And here she was, refugee, but a smart young woman who had actually achieved great heights, become a lawyer, was on a scholar, got a scholarship with Melbourne University but found it really challenging. It's, it is challenging for women across the board, but more so for women of color. You know? So I don't know, Sanita, if I've answered your question, but I think it's, it's important that we each do, do our bit. You know, there's still a glass ceiling for women that we find across the board. And I think this is for white women, women of color, and very difficult for refugee women. You know? I think we need to have policies. Like I know in Australia, like when I worked in Africa, there used to be a quota system in ministries, in government, in companies. And it meant that women who had the qualifications, who were really good, got an opportunity to be members of parliament, to be in the lower house, you know. Like, but I think this, it's still a, we're still a long way in Australia in many of those aspects. So I think we all have work to do, and we but but we need to continue. I think there is um, an an anger, and there is a sharing that this is this has gone for long enough, and we need to do something. But I think having the marches and having the visibility is fine, but it really needs to translate into more than that. It really needs to translate into implementation of strong policies that su support all women, that support our First Nation women, that support our migrant and refugee women, and support our, our white women across the board, yeah? Yes, okay. Yes, Local government, um, you know, 
The local government does a lot of initiatives like that. They, they've tried with smaller funding to, to help with that. But uh, I wouldn't say it was actually a result of the, the exhibition as such, but people actually, a small number of people responded directly to us. So they emailed me wanting to help, wanting to teach English, wanted to give back and how they could give back. So that was, that was good, you know. But with local government, I think the local government also, um, I might be wrong in this, yes, but it might be struggling with funding for their programs. Right for them several different things, but in fact, I was asked to increase the number of questions. I did increase the questions. So I, I will come back. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to you. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering has any research been done in the same manner with male refugees? And what the results of that in comparison to what we found with female There is uh, quite a lot of research that has been done on male refugees, and especially male youth. The results were, in fact, one of my PhD students is just completing a study on male youth, predominantly young men in, in Melbourne, and they were from South Sudanese background here. And um, they, they face terrible racism in the community. You know? So, and the media didn't help, you know, and some of our, the, the, the dialogue that came out from the ministers also impacted them, you know. So their disadvantage seemed a little more different because they felt the women were isolated because they have to look after the children. They were told these men would be outside, but they were targeted. So if there was a gro group of, say, young white men who were going to a match, then they were mates. But if there was a group of African young men going somewhere, they were, there was, that was a gang, you know, and they got targeted as a gang. And that, that is across the board in Australia. They get targeted. They, the other thing that they felt was as they were walking in supermarkets, they would be followed by a security guard. If they were outside on a road, they would be followed. Many a times they were pulled up by the police. You know. So they had different, different experiences that actually led to negative behaviors that that probably they wouldn't have had if they had more positive experiences. You know? So they have different experiences. Similar, they, they would like more English, but um, they would like more uh, opportunities to be employed. But it's easier for them to be employed, even in the lower skilled jobs. You know? And they would get employment, but often if they wanted to actually become more than what they were. There was a small group, cross-section of refugee youth, who wanted to go to university, who wanted to study, and wanted to do something different from what their parents did, being a taxi driver or a cleaner. You know, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to be profitably and productively employed. Yes, I'll come back to you. Yeah, um, I was thinking about um, what the mentioned about the role of men and gender equality. And I wonder if any of the women who migrated with their um, male partners, whether they, whether any of them experienced resistance to being involved in the project from their male partners, whether that they tried to present barriers or presented any emotional barriers to the women participating? Those who participated in the project came through a community collaborator. And they had no problem because they were coming through Isha. But maybe I might ask Rehab to say a few words because you, you deal with the women all the time. Do they face some, I think they do, in different ways, yeah? Yeah. Rehab, why, why yeah. don't you stand and... Hi, everyone. So we are a multicultural service. So sometimes, yes, we know that some of the women, they will come through different service, telling their husbands we're going to the doctor or midwife, and then they can go to different projects inside, like, you know, internally. So because some of them, they are facing, like, domestic violence issues, and sometimes they don't, the men, especially Middle Eastern, they don't like their women to go and just... Um, like uh, have like, you know, uh, getting uh, empowered. So they have to just uh, to put them a bit down. So they have their ways. Even we have psychologists and counselors. They don't tell their husbands they're going to the psychologist 
or a social worker. So they saying some because we are across as well as the road that is uh, Mirabuka shopping center. Sometimes they tell them we're going and they park there and they cross the road to us. Not not all of them, not majority, but there is a percentage. I would say 20 to 30 percent. Yeah. Hopefully I answered. Yes. Yes. Looking back at the term now, I see it as a very strong example for a whole of approaches on this. And the for that we've seen from the last year, I think we're going to make a part of it too, because what we've observed, largely from the practical side of the as well as our research is this huge gap between the theory driven at the federal level and what actually happens at the local level. And what we're seeing here with WA and other equipment is very scattered, isolated, almost any population of refugee who are not at the moment engaged in what we would like to do. Thank you very much, David. And I think it is true, we have, we, we have policies in place that need to be revisited so that we support this this woman. And yes, they're they're based on theory and they're based like for example, no country in the world has offshore detention you know, for for asylum seekers. We are the only country in the world. And this is because we are our neighboring our neighbors that house these refugees are poorer than us and are dependent on Australian aid. So this becomes a complex issue. So I, I think we we need to continue the advocacy and the dialogue and the evidence to inform change. I think that's important. So this research and the programs and the results from the program will hopefully um, bring about change. I think I will stop here now, Sam, and say just say that uh, I encourage you to just go to the Access Library. The exhibition is there, the nine banners. Thank you very much again for coming this afternoon. And there's tea, coffee, and, and just um, some refreshments for you all. So thank you very much for coming.